Okay, good day to all of you. So we are ready on our second um, lecture series for Computer Organization and Architecture by William Stallings. So on this chapter, we have chapter two, performance issues. So this chapter addresses the issue of computer system performance. We begin with the consideration of the need for balanced utilization of computer resources, which provides a perspective that is useful throughout the lecture series. Next, we look at contemporary computer organization designs intended to provide performance to meet current and projected demand. Finally, we look at tools and models that have been developed to provide a means of assessing comparative computer system performance. So let's start our lesson. So first is we have designing per performance. So year by year, the cost of computer systems continues to drop dramatically while the performance and capacity of those systems continue to rise equally dramatically. Today's laptops have the computing power of an IBM mainframe from 10 or 15 years ago. Thus, we have virtually free computer power. Processors are so inexpensive that we now have microprocessors we throw away. So these examples of microprocessors that we throw away is the digital pregnancy test is a very good example. Why? Because it is used, uh, it will be used once and then thrown away. And this continuing technological revolution has enabled the development of applications of outstanding complexity and power. For example, desktop applications that require the great power of today's microprocessor-based system include image processing, three-dimensional rendering, speech recognition, video conferencing, multimedia authoring, voice and video annotation of files, and simulation modeling. So this um, um, desktop applications, of course, are already found in our computers and, of course, may be personal computers or laptops. And then workstation systems now support highly sophisticated engineering and scientific applications and have the capacity to support image and video applications. In addition, businesses are relying on increasingly powerful servers to handle transaction and database processing and to support massive client or uh, client server networks that have replaced the huge mainframe computer centers of yesteryear. As well, cloud service providers use massive high performance banks of servers to satisfy high volume, high transaction rate applications for a broad spectrum of clients. What is fascinating about all this from the perspective of computer organization and architecture is that, on the one hand, the basic building blocks for today's computer miracles are virtually the same as those of the IAS computer from over 50 years ago, while on the other hand, the techniques for squeezing the maximum performance out of the materials at hand have become increasingly sophisticated. So this observation serves as a guiding principle for the presentation in this lecture series as we progress through the various elements and components of a computer two objectives are pursued first this lecture series explains the fundamental functionality in each area under consideration and second this explores those techniques required to achieve maximum performance in the remainder of this chapter we highlight some of the driving factors behind the need to design for performance so next is uh, we have the microprocessor speed so what gives Intel x86 processors or IBM mainframe computers such mind-boggling power is the relentless pursuit of speed by processor chip manufacturers. The evolution of these machines continues to bear out of Moore's law mentioned previously. So long as this law holds, chip makers can unleash a new generation of chips every three years with four times as many transistors. In memory chips, this has quadrupled the capacity of dynamic random access memory or the DRAM, still the basic technology for computer main memory, every three years. In microprocessors, the addition of new circuits and the speed boost that comes from reducing the distances between them has improved performance four or five-fold every three years or so since Intel launched its x86 family in 1978. But 
the raw speed of the microprocessor will not achieve its potential unless it is fed a constant stream of work to do in the form of computer instructions. Anything that gets in the way of that smooth flow undermines the power of the processor. Accordingly, while the chip makers have been busy learning how to fabricate chips of greater and greater density, the processor designer must come up with ever more elaborate techniques for feeding the monster. Among these techniques built into contemporary processors are the following. So first is we have the pipelining. So the execution of an instruction involves multiple stages of operation, including fetching the instruction, decoding the opcode, fetching operands, performing a calculation, and so on. Pipelining enables a processor to work simultaneously on multiple instructions by performing a different phase for each of the multiple instructions at the same time. The processor overlaps operations by moving data or instructions into a conceptual pipe with all stages of the pipe processing simultaneously. For example, while one instruction is being executed, the computer is decoding the next instruction. So this principle is also can be seen in an assembly line. So for an assembly line, for example, for a car assembly line. So for example, the first station is for the chassis, then next is for the body, and next is for the painting, and then next station, the fourth station is... Um, for uh, finishing for an as an example and then after the first uh, the first uh, car is finished with the chassis is next is the body so to the second station and then of course uh, there will be a car number two that will follow uh, for the chassis chassis body paint and then finishing touches that's that's just an example so that's actually the principle with pipelining so next is we have branch prediction the processor looks ahead in the instruction code fetched from memory and predicts which branches or group of instructions are likely to be processed next if the processor guesses right most of the time it can prefetch the correct instructions and buffer them so that the processor is kept busy the more sophisticated examples of this strategy pre predict not just the next branch, but multiple branches ahead. Thus, branch prediction increases the amount of work available for the processor to execute. So next is we have the super scalar execution. So this is the ability to issue more than one instruction in every processor clock cycle. In effect, multiple parallel pipelines are used. So super scalar uh, came from the idea of pipelining. And then uh, by pipelining, uh, you have many pipelines. So that is the idea for super scalar execution. Next is we have the data flow analysis. So the processor analyzes which instructions are dependent on each other's results or data to create an optimized schedule of instructions. In fact, instructions are scheduled to be executed when ready, independent of the original program order. This prevents a necessary delay. So last but not the least is we have the speculative execution. Using branch prediction and data flow analysis, some processors speculatively execute instructions ahead of their actual appearance in the program execution, holding the results in temporary locations. This enables the processor to keep its execution engines as busy as possible by executing instructions that are likely to be needed. So this and other sophisticated techniques are made necessary by the sheer power of the processor. Collectively, they make it possible to execute many instructions per processor cycle rather than to take many cycles per instruction. So for this um, microprocessor speed, the only objective here is to make the processor always busy, not, uh, not to make it idle or nothing to work on. Okay, next is we have the performance balance. So while processor power has raced ahead at breakneck speed, other critical components of the computer have not kept up. So the result is a need to look for performance balance. So an adjusting of the organization and architecture to compensate for the mismatch among the capabilities of the various components. So the problem created by such mismatches is particularly critical at the interface between processor and main memory. While processor speed has grown rapidly, 
the speed with which data can be transferred between the main memory and the processor has lagged badly. So the interface between the processor and main memory is the most crucial pathway in the entire computer because it is responsible for carrying a constant flow of program instructions and data between memory chips and the processor. If memory or the pathway fails to keep pace with the processor's insistent demands, the processor stalls in a wait state and valuable processing time is lost. So actually, um, maybe there's, do you have a mindset for example, that your computer is lagging. So the solution here is you have to add additional capacity for your random access memory. It may have a little effect. Why? Because uh, it's not the capacity of the RAM, but the, uh, the, the pathway between the processor and the main memory. How fast is the pathway or the bus between them or the interconnection within them? If you're not going to change the speed of that pathway, um, the, the added speed for the RAM uh, will have a little effect. But of course, um, if you're going to upgrade for a, for a desktop, you need to change the motherboard. And then for a laptop, um, you can only upgrade the, the random access memory. So it's very lucky for a desktop because you're just going to replace the motherboard. But for a laptop, uh, you're going to change the whole uh, computer because, of course, um, for laptops, there is only a limited uh, update such as upgrades of hard drives and uh, main memory. So as we continue, so a system architect can attack this problem in a number of ways, all of which are reflected in contemporary computer designs. Consider the following examples. So first is we have increased the number of bits that are retrieved at one time by making DRAMs wider rather than deeper and by using wide bass data paths. So that's, uh, this is the first one. Um, the, the interconnections between the processor and the main memory, you should make it wide so that it can accommodate more um, bits. And then next is either change the DRAM interface to make it more efficient by including a cache or other buffering scheme on the DRAM chip. Next is reduce the frequency of memory access by incorporating increasingly complex and efficient cache structures between the processor and main memory. So you have to add the cache. So this includes the incorporation of one or more caches on the processor chip as well as an on-off chip cache close to the processor chip. So that's why, as you can see in our previous uh, uh, chapter, we have an L1, L2, and L3 cache. L1 is L2 so is situated inside the processor, um, the core, while the L3 is outside the core. And then next, increase the interconnect bandwidth between processors and memory by using higher speed buses and a hierarchy of buses to buffer and structure data flow. So next is we have this um, um, figure 2.1, the typical I.O. device data rates. So another area of design focus is the handling of input-output devices. As computers become faster and more capable, more sophisticated applications are developed that support the use of peripherals with intensive I.O. demands. So in this figure, give some examples of typical peripheral devices in use on personal computers and workstations. So these devices create tremendous data throughput demands. While the current generation of processors can handle the data pumped out by these devices, there remains the problem of getting that data moved between the processor and peripheral. So strategies here include caching and buffering schemes plus the use of higher speed interconnection buses and more elaborate structures of buses. So in addition, the use of multi multiple processor configurations can aid in satisfying I.O. demands. So the key in all this is balance. So designers constantly strive to balance the throughput and processing demands of the processor components, main memory, I.O. devices, and the interconnection structures. So this design must constantly be rethought to cope with two constantly evolving factors such as First is the rate at which performance is changing in the various technology areas. So the, the technology areas of the processor, buses, memory, peripherals differs greatly from one type of element to another. 
Next is we have new applications and new peripheral devices constantly change the nature of the demand on the system in terms of typical instruction profile and the data access patterns. So thus, computer design is a constantly evolving art form. So this lecture series attempts to present the fundamentals on which this art form is based and to present a survey of the current state of that art. So next is we have improvements in chip organization and architecture. So as designer wrestle with the challenge of balancing processor performance with that of main memory and other computer components, the need to increase processor speed remains. There are three approaches to achieving increased processor speed. First is increase the hardware speed of the processor. So this increase is fundamentally due to shrinking the size of the logic gates on the processor chip so that more gates can be packed together more tightly and to increasing the clock rate. So with gates closer together, the propagation time for signals is significantly reduced, enabling a speeding up of the processor. An increase in clock rate also means that the individual operations are executed more rapidly. So next is increase the size and speed of caches that are interposed between the processor and main memory. In particular, by dedicating a portion of the processor chip itself to the cache, cache access times drop significantly. Then third is make changes to the processor organization and architecture that increase the effective speed of instruction execution. So typically, this involves using parallelism in one form or another. So, what will be the problems with clock speed and uh, lag in density? So, traditionally, the dominant factor in performance gains has been in increases in clock speed due to logic density. So, sorry for the wrong spelling, it is logic density. However, as clock speed and logic density increase, a number of obstacles become more significant. So, what are these obstacles? First is power. So, as the density of logic and the clock speed on a chip increase, so does the power density, of course, because you have more logic gates, so it means that it needs more power. So, the difficulty of dissipating the heat generated on high-density, high-speed chips is becoming a serious design issue. Next is we have the RC delay. So, the speed at which electrons can flow on a chip between transistors is limited by the resistance and capacitance of the metal wires connecting them. So, RC is resistance and capacitance. Specifically, delay increases as the RC product increases. As components on the chip decrease in size, the wire interconnects become thinner, increasing resistance. Also, the wires are closer together, increasing capacitance. And then next is we have memory latency. Memory speeds lag processor speeds as previously discussed. Thus, there will be more emphasis on organization and architectural approaches to improving performance. These techniques are discussed in later chapters of the lecture series. So next is we have a figure, figure 2.2, we have the processor trends. So beginning in the late 1980s, and continuing for about 15 years, two main strategies have been used to increase performance beyond what can be achieved simply by increasing clock speed. First, there has been an increase in cache capacity. There are now typically two or three levels of cache as previously illustrated in Chapter 1, the L1, L2, and L3 between the processor and main memory. As chip density has increased, more of the cache memory has been incorporated on the chip, enabling faster cache access. For example, the original Pentium chip devoted about 10% of on-chip area to caches. Contemporary chips devote over half of the chip area to caches. And then typically, about three quarters of the other half is for pipeline-related control and buffering. And then next... The instruction execution logic within a processor has become increasingly complex to enable parallel execution of instructions within the processor. Two noteworthy design approaches have been, have been in pipelining and superscalar. So a pipeline works much as an assembly line as previously explained in a manufacturing plant enabling different stages of executions of different instructions to occur at the same time along the pipeline. 
And then next is we have this, a superscalar approach in essence allows multiple pipelines within a single processor so that instructions that do not depend on one another can be executed in parallel. And then next, by the mid of uh, to late 90s, both of these approaches were reaching a point of diminishing returns. The internal organization of contemporary processors is exceedingly complex and is able to squeeze a great deal of parallelism out of the instruction stream. It seems likely that further significant increases in this direction will be relatively modest. With three levels of cache on the processor chip, each level providing substantial capacity, it also seems that, that the benefits from the cache are reaching a limit. However, simply relying on increasing clock rate for increased performance runs into the power dissipation problem already referred to. So the faster the clock rate, the greater the amount of power to be dissipated and some fundamental physical limits are being reached. So if you have a faster clock rate, you, uh, it also means that uh, each, uh, the processor should di dissipate the heat um, fast, also faster. And then this figure illustrates the concepts we have been discussing. So the top line shows that as per Moore's law, the number of transistors on a chip continues to grow exponentially. So we have this, the top line we have for the transistors as per Moore's law. And then meanwhile, the clock speed has leveled off in order to prevent a further rise in power. So we have the frequency, which is the frequency, as you can see, it is already, um, it will not be increased because if you're going to increase the, uh, the clock speed, it means that uh, there is a mechanism to dissipate the heat faster. And then next is to continue. Continue to increase performance, designers have had to find ways of exploiting the growing number of transistors other than simply building a more complex processor. So the response in recent years has been the development of the multi-core computer chip. So what is multi-core? So with all of the difficulties cited in the preceding paragraphs in mind, designers have turned to a fundamentally new approach to improving performance. So placing multiple processors on the same chip with a large shared cache. So the use of multiple processors on the same chip, also referred to as multiple cores or multi-core, provides the potential to increase performance without increasing the clock rate. Uh, why? Because there is a saying that two heads are better than one. So as I've already um, illustrated the example, for a multi-core, if, if you're a human, you have one head but you have two brains inside. That's an example, uh, dual core. And then next is, studies indicate that within a processor, the increase in performance is roughly proportional to the square root of the increase in complexity. But if the software can support the effective use of multiple processors, then doubling the number of processors almost doubles performance. Thus, the strategy is to use two simpler processors on the chip rather than one more complex processor, which is um, requires um, faster clock rate and it should have a mechanism to dissipate heat faster. So in addition, with two processors, larger caches are justified. This is important because the power consumption of memory logic on a chip is much less than of the processing logic. As the logic density on chips continues to rise, the trend to both more cores and more cache on a single chip continues. Two core chips were quickly followed by four core chips or the quad core, then eight octa core, then we have also 16 and so on. As the caches became larger, it made performance sense to create two and then three levels of cache on a chip. With the first level cache dedicated to an individual processor and levels two and three being shared by all the processors. It is now common for the second level cache to also be private to each core as illustrated in, last, in the last chapter. So next is we have the Many Integrated Core or MIC or in the Graphics Processing Unit or the GPU. So chip manufacturers are now in the process of making a huge leap forward in the number of cores per chip with more than 50 cores per chip. The leap in performance as well as the challenges in developing software to exploit such a large number of cores have led to the introduction of a new term. So we have the Many Integrated Core or the MIC. 
So the multi-core and MIC strategy involves a homogeneous collection of general purpose processors on a single chip. At the same time, chip manufacturers are pursuing another design option, a chip with multiple general purpose processors plus the graphics processing units or the GPUs and specialized cores for video processing and other tasks. In broad terms, a GPU is a core designed to perform parallel operations and graphics data. Um, graphics processing unit is created so that to deload the main processor of, uh, of processing this um, parallel operations and graphics data. And then traditionally, found on a plug-in graphics card or display adapter, it is used to encode and render 2D and 3D graphics as well as process video. So since GPUs perform parallel operations on multiple sets of data, they are increasingly being used as vector processors also for a variety of applications that require repetitive computations. So this blurs the line between the GPU and the CPU. So when a broad range of applications are supported by such processors, the term general purpose computing on GPUs is used. So that's why um, GPUs is not only using for um, for 2D and 3D rendering, but it can also be used in general purpose like that of a, of a general purpose CPU. So we explored these design characteristics of multi-core uh, computers rather in Chapter 18 and GP, GPUs in Chapter 19. So next is we have the Amdahl's Law. So computer system designers look for ways to improve system performance by advances in technology or change in design. Examples include the use of parallel processors, the use of a memory cache hierarchy, and speed up in memory access time and I.O. transfer rate due to technology improvements. In all of these cases, it is important to note that a speed up in one aspect of the technology or design does not result in... In improvement in performance. So that's why I'm saying is we have the, um, um, for example, uh, as I've already mentioned, you have the memory and um, your computer is, a laptop or computer is lagging and then um, you add another set of DRAM but it only improves a little because uh, the only aspect that you have improved is the memory, but you did not improve the pathway or the interconnection between the main memory and the processor. So this limitation is succinctly expressed by Amdahl's law. So Amdahl's law was first proposed by Gene Amdahl in 1967 and deals with the potential speed up of a program using multiple processors compared to a single processor. Nevertheless, Amdahl's law illustrates the problems facing the industry in the development of multi-core machines with an ever-growing number of cores. So the software that runs on such machines must be adapted to a highly parallel execution environment to exploit the power of parallel processing. So Amdahl's law can be generalized to evaluate any design or technical improvement in a computer system. So next is we have figure 2.3, which is an illustration of Amdahl's law. So consider a program running on a single processor such that a fraction, so a fraction is 1 minus f, so we have this one, uh, of the execution time involves code that is inherently serial and a fraction F that involves code that is infinitely parallelizable with no scheduling overhead. So let T be the total execution time of the program using a single processor. Then the speed up using a parallel processor with N processors that fully exploits the parallel portion of the program is as follows. So the speed up is equal to time to execute program on a single processor divided by uh, time processor to execute program on n parallel processors. So we have this um, formula. Okay, so this equation is illustrated in this figure. So I have a separate discussion for how to solve the Amdahl's law by means of Amdahl's law and uh, what Amdahl's law is solving is the speed up of the computer system. So next is we have another figure, 2.4, so Amdahl's law for multi-processors. So two important conclusions can be drawn. First, when f is small, the use of parallel processor has little effect. 
As n approaches infinity, speed up is bound by 1 over 1 minus f so that there are diminishing returns for using more processors. So these conclusions are too pessimistic, an assertion first put forward. For example, a server can maintain multiple threads or multiple tasks to handle multiple clients and execute the threads or tasks in parallel up to the limit of the number of processors. So many database applications involve computation on massive amounts of data that can be split up into multiple parallel tasks. So aside from Amdahl's law, we have another law, uh, what we call Lil's law. So a fundamental and simple relation with broad application is Lil's law. We can apply it to almost any system that is statistically in steady state and in which there is no leakage. So using queuing theory terminology, Lil's law applies to a queuing system. So the central element of the system is a server which provides some service to items. Items from some population of items arrive at the system to be served. If the server is idle, an item is served immediately. Otherwise, an arriving item joins a waiting line or queue. And then there can be a single queue for a single server, a single queue for multiple servers, or multiple queues, one for each multiple servers. When a server has completed serving an item, the item departs. If there are items waiting in the queue, one is immediately dispatched to the server. The server in this model can represent anything that performs some function or service for a collection of items. Examples of this are a processor provides service to processes. A transmission line provides a transmission service to packets or frames of data. And an I.O. device provides a read or write service for I.O. requests. So the average number of items in a queuing system equals the average rate at which items arrive multiplied by the average time that an item spends in the system. This relationship requires very few assumptions. We do not need to know what the service time distribution is, what the distribution of arrival times is, or the order or priority in which items are served. Because of its simplicity and generality, Lil's law is extremely useful and has experienced somewhat of a revival due to the interest in performance problems related to multi-core computers. So next is we have um, the system clock as illustrated in figure 2.5. So operations performed by a processor, such as fetching an instruction, decoding the instruction, performing an arith arithmetic operation, and so on, are governed by a system clock. Typically, all operations begin with the pulse of the clock. Thus, the most fundamental level, the speed of a processor is dictated by the pulse frequency produced by the clock measured in cycles per second or in hertz. So typically, clock signals are generated by a quartz crystal, which generates a constant sine wave while power is applied. So this sine wave is converted into a digital voltage pulse stream that is provided in a constant flow to the processor circuitry as you can see in figure 2.5. So this figure. So for example, a 1 gigahertz processor receives 1 billion pulses per second. So as you can see, we have a 1 gigahertz processor. It means it has, it can receive 1 billion pulses per second. So um, it's very unfair to say that your computer is already lagging because of the pulses that it can produce per second. Um, why is your computer lagging? Maybe you're not, you're not good at maintaining your computer. So next is the rate of pulses is known as the clock rate or the clock speed. One increment or a pulse of the clock is referred to as a clock cycle or a clock tick. The time between pulses is the cycle time. So this is the clock rate so one set for this is the on and this is the off so that's that's already the um, clock cycle and then the clock rate is not arbitrary but must be appropriate for the physical layout of the processor actions in the processor require signals to be sent from one processor element to another when a signal is placed on a line inside the processor, it takes some finite amount of time for the voltage levels to settle down so that an accurate value of 1 or 0 is available. 
Furthermore, depending on the physical layout of the processor circuits, some signals may change more rapidly than others. Thus, operations must be synchronized and paced so that proper electrical signals such as the voltage uh, values are available for each operation. So the execution of an instruction involves a number of discrete steps, such as fetching the instruction from memory, decoding the various portions of the instruction, loading and storing data, and performing arithmetic and logical operations. Thus, most instructions on most processors require multiple clock cycles to complete. Some instructions may take only a few cycles, while others require dozens. In addition, when pipelining is used, multiple instructions are being executed simultaneously. Thus, a straight comparison of clock speeds on different processors does not tell the whole story about performance. So it means that you should not just rely on the clock speed of a processor in, in terms that, oh, my clock speed has this um, um, 4 gigahertz, so it's fast. It, it's not just the basis for, for your computer system to have a very good uh, performing computer. So next is we have an illustration or we can show you table 2.1, the performance factors and system attributes. So this table is a matrix in which one dimension shows the five performance factors and the other dimension shows the four system attributes. An X is in a cell indicates a system attribute that affects a performance factor. A common measure of performance for a processor is the rate at which instructions are executed, expressed as millions of instructions per second or the MIPS, or referred to as the MIPS rate. Another common performance measure deals only with floating point instructions. These are common in many scientific and game applications. So floating point performance is expressed as millions of floating point operations per second or MFLAPS. Okay, so next is we have calculating the mean. So in evaluating some aspect of computer system performance, it is often the case that a single number, such as execution time or memory consumed, is used to characterize performance and to compare systems. Clearly, a single number can provide only a very simplified view of a system's capability. Nevertheless, and especially in the field of benchmarking, single numbers are typically used for performance comparison. So as is discussed in, section, in this section, so the use of benchmarks to compare systems involves calculating the mean value of a set of data points related to execution time. It turns out that there are multiple alternative algorithms that can be used for calculating a mean value, and this has been the source of some controversy in the benchmarking field. So in this section, we define these alternative algorithms and comment on some of their properties. So this prepares us for a discussion in the next section of mean calculation in benchmarking. So the three common formulas used for calculating a mean is we have arithmetic, geometric, and harmonic. So before that, we have a figure, so comparison of means on various data sets. So this figure illustrates the three means applied to various data sets, each of which has 11 data points and a maximum data point value of 11. So as we can see in the figure. So the median value is also included in the chart. Perhaps what stands out the most in this figure is that the harmonic or the HM the HM harmonic mean has a tendency to produce a misleading result when the data is skewed to larger values or when there is a small value outlier. So to continue, so an arithmetic mean or AM is an appropriate measure if the sum of all the measurement is a meaningful and interesting value. The AM is a good candidate for comparing the execution time performance of several systems. For example, suppose we were interested in using a system for large-scale simulation studies and wanted to evaluate several alternative products. On each system, we could run the simulation multiple times with different input values for each run and then take the average execution time across all runs. So the use of multiple runs with different inputs should ensure that the results are not heavily biased by some unusual feature of a given input set. So the AM of all the runs is a good measure of the system's performance on simulations and a good number to use for system comparison. 
So the AM used for a time-based variable such as seconds, such as program execution time, has the important property that it is directly proportional to the total time. So if the total time doubles, the mean value also doubles. So next is we have uh, table 2.2. We have a comparison of arithmetic and harmonic means for rates. So a simple numerical example will illustrate the difference between the two means in calculating a mean of the rates as shown in this table. So the table compares the performance of three computers, so computer A, B, and C, uh, on the execution of two programs. For simplicity, we assume that the execution of each program results in the execution of 108 floating point operations. The left half of the table shows the execution times for each computer. So this is the first half or the left half. Uh, each computer running each program, the total execution time, and the arithmetic mean of the execution times. So for this table, so computer A, executes in less time in less total time than b which executes also in less total time than c and this is reflected accurately in the arithmetic mean as you can see here so we have 1.38 for computer a 1.5 with computer b and 2.38 with computer c so meaning um it will uh of course computer a is the fastest so next is we have the right half of the table provides a comparison in terms of rates expressed in M flops. The rate calculation is straightforward. For example, program 1 executes 100 million floating point operations. Computer A takes 2 seconds to execute the program for a M flops rate of 100 divided by 2 is equal to 50. Next, consider the AM of the rates. The greatest value is for computer A, which suggests that A is the fastest computer. In terms of total execution time, A has the minimum time, of course, because uh, the computer A is the fastest. So it is, the, of course, the fastest computer of the three. But the AM rates shows B as slower than C. Whereas, in fact, B is faster than C as we can see with the arithmetic mean of times in the execution time. Looking at the harmonic mean values, we see that they correctly reflect the speed ordering of the computers. This confirms that the harmonic mean is preferred when calculating rates. So the reader may wonder why go through all this effort. If you want to compare execution times, we could simply just compare the total execution times of the three systems. If you want to compare rates, we could simply take the inverse of the total execution time as shown in the table. There are two reasons for doing the individual calculations rather than only looking at the aggregate numbers. So first is we have a customer or researcher may be interested not only in the ov overall average performance but also the performance against the different types of benchmark programs such as business applications, scientific modeling, multimedia applications, and systems programs. Thus, a breakdown of type of benchmark is needed as well as a total. And then the second reason is... Usually, the different programs used for evaluations are weighted differently. As shown in the table, it is assumed that the two test programs execute the same number of operation. If that is not the case, we may want to weight accordingly. Or different programs could be weighed differently to reflect importance or priority. So next, we have uh, for table 2.3, a comparison of arithmetic and geometric means for normalized results. So a simple example will illustrate the way in which the geometric mean exhibits consistency for normalized results. So in this table, we use the same performance results as were used in the previous table. So in uh, this table, uh, 2.3a, all results are normalized to computer A, and the means are calculated on the normalized values. Based on the ex total execution time, A is faster than B, which is faster than C. And then both AMs and GMs of the normalized times reflect this. While on table 2.3B, the systems are now normalized to B. Again, the geometric means correctly reflect the relative speeds of the true computers, but now the AM produces a different ordering. 
So, to continue is we have another table. So, another comparison of arithmetic and geometric means for normalized results. So, we have, so, sadly, consistency does not always produce correct results. So, in this table, some of the execution times are altered. Once again, the AM reports conflicting results for the normalizations. The geometric mean reports consistent results, but the result is that B is faster than A and C, which is not the case, and then which are equal. And then next is SPEC has chosen to use the geometric means for several reasons. So first is we have, as mentioned, the geometric mean gives consistent results as regardless of which system is used as reference for normalization. Because benchmarking is primarily a comparison analysis, this is an important feature. As documented and confirmed in subsequent analysis by SPEC analyst or SPCE, SPEC, the GM is less biased by outliers uh, compared to the harmonic mean or arithmetic mean. And then next, this demonstrates that distributions of performance ratios are better modeled by log normal distributions than nor run by normal ones because of the generally skewed distribution of the normalized numbers. So this is uh, as can be seen. And as shown in the equation, the geometric mean can be described as the back transferred, transformed average of a log normal distribution. So uh, we already mentioned benchmark principles. So next is we have this, of course, benchmark, benchmark principles. Measures such as MIPS or MFLAPS have proven inadequate to evaluating the performance of processors. Because of differences in instruction sets, the instruction execution rate is not a valid means of comparing performance of different architectures. So another consideration is that performance of a given processor on a given program may not be useful in determining how that processor will perform on a very different type of application. Accordingly, beginning in the late 1980s and early 1990s, industry and academic interest shifted to measuring the performance of systems using a set of benchmark programs. So the same set of programs can be run on different machines and the execution times compared. So benchmarks provide guidance to customers trying to decide which system to buy and can be useful to vendors and designers in determining how to design systems to meet benchmark goals. So the, the following are the desirable characteristics of a benchmark program. First, it should be written in a high-level language, making it portable across different machines. Next, it is a representative of a particular kind of programming domain or paradigm, such as systems programming, numerical programming, or commercial programming. And then it, can, uh, it should be it, uh, to be measured, it can be measured easily and it has a wide distribution. So next is we have the System Performance Evaluation Corporation or the SPEC or SPEC. So the common need in industry and academic and research communities for generally accepted computer performance measurements has led to the development of standardized benchmark suites. A benchmark suite is a collection of programs defined in a high-level language that together attempt to provide a representative test of a computer in a particular application or system programming area. The best-known such collection of benchmark suites is defined and maintained, of course, by the System Performance Evaluation Corporation or the SPEC or SPEC, which is an industry consortium. So, SPEC performance measurements are widely used for comparison and research purposes. So we have a specific uh, benchmark. We have the SPEC CPU 2006 or 2006. So the best known of the SPEC benchmark suites is the SPEC CPU 2006. This is the industry standard suite for processor intensive applications. That is, SPEC 2006 is appropriate for measuring performance for applications that spend most of their time in doing computation rather than the I.O. So the CPU 2006 suite is based on existing applications that have already been ported to a wide variety of platforms by spec industry members. It consists of 17 floating point programs written in C, 
C++ and Fortran, and 12 integer programs written in C and C++. So the suite contains over 3 million lines of code. This is the fifth generation of processor-intensive suites from SPEC, replacing the SPEC CPU 2000, SPEC CPU 95, SPEC CPU 92, and SPEC CPU 89. Other spec suites include the following, such as the spec JVM98. So it is intended to evaluate performance of the combined hardware and software aspects of the Java Virtual Machine or the JVM Client Platform. Another one is we have the spec JBB2000 or JBB stands for Java Business Benchmark, a benchmark for evaluating server-side Java-based electronic commerce applications. And then we also have spec web 99, evaluates the performance of worldwide web servers. And then the spec mail 2001, designed to measure a system's performance acting as a mail server. So it means this benchmarks, um, it can be specific to a particular purpose or task. Okay, next is we have a table uh, illustrated in table 2.5, the SPEC 2006 integer benchmarks. Okay, next is we have, uh, for table 2.6, is the SPEC 2006 floating point benchmarks. So SPEC uses a historical SUN system, the Ultra Enterprise 2, which was introduced in 1997 as the reference machine. The reference machine uses the 296 MHz Ultra Spark 2 processor. It takes about 12 days to do a rule-conforming run of the base metrics for CINT 2006 and CFP 2006 on the CPU 2006 reference machine. So the tables 2.5, which is the previous table, and this current table 2.6 show the amount of time to run each benchmark using the reference machine. The tables also show the dynamic instruction counts on the reference machine. So this value are the actual number of instructions executed during the run of each program. So, we have to review the terms used in spec documentation. So, to better understand results published of a system using CPU 2006, we define the following terms used in the spec documentation. So, we have the following terms, benchmark, a program written in a high-level language that can be compiled and executed on any computer that implements the compiler. Next is we have the system under test. This is the system to be evaluated. And then next is we have the reference machine. This is a system used by SPEC to establish a baseline performance for all benchmarks. Each benchmark is run and measured on this machine to establish a reference time for that benchmark. A system under test is evaluated by running the CPU 2006 benchmark and comparing the results for running the same programs on the reference machine. So actually, that's the real purpose of benchmark. So um, if you're having, uh, if you want to know uh, the performance of your computer and then you're going to have a performance benchmark software, um, the, uh, the benchmark software already has a, uh, a collection or a database of co computer of the whole uh, computer system. Uh, with memory, with uh, CPU speeds, and then it will going, uh, it will going to um, test your computer, and then compare your results against the benchmark as the basis. As you can know, oh, um, this is for example, uh, the the benchmark has the fastest computer system uh, specs in in its database, and then if you're going to compare that, um, it doesn't reach. The, the specs or the, res the performance results of that computer in the database, it means, of course, uh, your computer um, lacks performance in relation to the, to the specs of the computer in the database of the benchmark. So let's continue. So base metric is these are required for all reported results and have strict guidelines for compilations. In essence, the standard compiler with more or less default settings should be used on each system under test to achieve comparable result. Next is we have the peak metric. This enables users to attempt to optimize system performance by optimizing the compiler output. For example, different compiler options may be used on each benchmark and feedback directed optimization is allowed. Next is we have the speed metric. 
This is simply a measurement of the time it takes to execute a compiled benchmark. So the speed metric is used for comparing the ability of a computer to complete single task. And then last but not the least is we have the rate metric. This is a measurement of how many tasks a computer can accomplish in a certain amount of time. This is called a throughput, capacity, or rate measure. The rate metric allows the system under test to execute simultaneous tasks to take advantage of multiple processors. Okay, next is to continue our discussion is we have an illustration, figure 2.7, the spec evaluation flowchart. So we now consider the specific calculations that are done to assess a system. We consider the integer benchmarks. The same procedures are used to create a floating point benchmark value. For the integer benchmarks, there are 12 programs in the test suite. So calculation is a three-step process. If we have 12 programs, so it means if we're going to start the new pro, uh, start with the flowchart, then get the next program, run the program three times, select the meridian value, and then we have the ratio. And then after calculating this, is do you have more programs? So for the example, we have 12. So yes, it will going to in a in a cycle uh, until all the 12 programs are finished executing. And then after the question, there are no more programs. So no, compute geometric mean of all ratio and this will be, uh, the result will be displayed or uh, it, uh, the output is already available. So next is we have the table 2.7 some spec CINT 2006 results for Sunblade 1000. So the results for the Sunblade 1000 are shown in this table. One of the spec CPU 2006 integer benchmark is we have the 464.264 uh, ref. This is a reference implementation of H.264 slash AVC or advanced video coding. So this is the latest state of the art video compression standard. So the Sunblade 1000 executes this program in a meridian time of 5,259 seconds. The reference implementation requires 22,130 seconds. The ratio is calculated as 22,130 divided by 5,259 is equal to 4.21. So the speed metric is calculated by taking the 12th root of the product of the ratio. So we have, you're going to uh, multiply all uh, 3.18, 2.96, 2.98 times 3.91, all of them multiply and then raise to 1 over 12, which is equivalent to 3.12. So next table is we have the, uh, how about the Sunblade X6250? So the results for the Sunblade X6250 are shown in this table. So this system has two processor chips with two cores per chip for a total of four cores. To get the, the rate metric, each benchmark program is executed simultaneously on all four cores with the execution time being the time from the start of all four copies to the end of the slowest run. The speed ratio is al calculated as before and the rate value is simply 4 times the speed ratio. So the final metric is found by taking the geometric mean of the rate value. So we have the 78.63 times 62.97, then multiply all these values, and then the result is you have to raise it to the power of 1 over 12, and then the result will be equal to 71.59. Okay, for the summary, so what have we learned in Chapter 2 is we have designing for performance such as the microprocessor speed, performance balance, and improvements in chip organization and architecture. So also it included here is the multi-core MICs, GP, GPUs, and then Amdahl's Law, Lil's Lil Law, and then basic measures of computer for performance such as clock speed and instruction execution rate. Then calculating the mean, um, we have three types. We have the arithmetic mean, harmonic mean, and geometric mean. And then we also have benchmark principles and spec benchmarks. So this is the end of our lecture for Chapter 2, Performance Issues. So I hope that you've learned something about... Um, how do we measure the performance of a computer system? So I hope that you have learned something from this chapter. And please 
um, like and subscribe to my channel. So thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.